In this example, I'm just going to show you how to work one problem using the simplex method. But it may seem overwhelming at first, but, but that's because I do a lot of explaining as I go here. Once you work through a couple of these and learn the rules, it's actually much easier. So just trust me. So just follow along here. All right, here's our example. And this is a standard maximization problem. So since it's maximization and it's less than or equal to non-negative numbers and I have my non-negative constraints, then I can use the simplex method. So the first step of your simplex method is to set up your initial system of constraints. So what I've got to do is I've got to take each less than inequality and convert them to equations by adding a slack variable. So I take x1 plus 2x2 and I add a slack variable, in this case s1, and that gives me the equation 32. And then the second one, 3x1 plus 4x2, I add a slack variable to that one, and that gives me uh, 3x1 plus 4x2 plus s2 equals 84. And again, these are just slack variables and they have to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, we take the uh, equation, the objective function, and we, we've got to get an equation from the objective function. What we have to do, though, is we have to move all of the x terms from the right side to the left side. So we need to move the 50x1 and the 80x2 to the other side of the equal sign. Now, if I do that, they'll change sign. So basically what we're doing is we're just setting this equation equal to zero by moving all the terms to the left. So if you move the 50x1 over, you get minus 50x1. You move the 80x2 over, you get minus 80x2. And of course the P will still be there. And then you'll just have zero on the left. And so now if you take this equation and put it with the other two, that's what we call our initial system of equations. So now we have our initial system of equations. And notice that this ha there's three equations and um, there are five uh, variables here because there's one, two, three, four, and now with P there's five, five variables. Now since we have three equations, we're going to have three basic variables and and therefore we'll have two non-basic variables okay so now the second step is to set up an initial what's called an initial simplex tableau from this system so here's the here's the initial system of equations now a tableau is really a matrix but we don't call it a matrix so when we set up the initial simplex tableau you don't have to fool with this over here if you don't want to i'll just show you so Let's, we're going to put this in matrix form. So what I need to do is I need to label a column for each variable. So I'm going to need a column for x1, a column for x2, a column for s1, a column for s2, a column for p, and then of course I'll have a column for the constants. So it's just like setting up um, an augmented matrix for solving a system of equations, but we don't call it that. So Actually, let's read across the coefficients of my first equation. In my first equation, I have 1x1 plus 2x2 plus 1s1. And notice there's no s2, so I put 0 for under the s2 column. There's no p, so put 0 there. And then the constant is 32. So that takes care of the first, first row or first equation. Second equation, we have 3x1 plus 4x2, we have no s1 in the second equation, but we do have 1s2, we have no p, and the constant's 84. And then the third equation, we put that on the bottom, and we separate it with a, a horizontal line. So negative 50x1, negative 80x2, and there's no s1, there's no s2 in, in that equation, and there's p, so we'll put 1 for 1p, and then the constant is zero. Now, what this does is it gives me kind of the worst case scenario. So it starts out, if you take a look at these columns here, this column, notice it has 
one zero zero under s one and then this column has zero one zero under s two and then this column has uh, zero zero one under p so actually it the uh, tableau begins with these slack variables and your objective function variable being the basic variables now notice s1 is a basic variable and notice the one is in row one so when we write s1 beside row one we're writing it beside row one because the one for the s1 variable is actually in row one and then for s2 notice that the one is in row two so s2 is identified as a basic variable but it's associated with row two and then for the p column the one is in row three so the p is associated as a basic variable with row three now i can easily show you why it works this way let me just show you real quick now remember we're starting out in the beginning with s1 s2 and p are your basic variables right so these are the three basic variables well if they're the three basic variables then x1 and x2 would be non-basic and remember what i told you earlier non-basic variables are zero well if x1 and x2 are non-basic go back up here and look at where i wrote it uh, as systems of equations. If x1 and x2 are non-basic, therefore they're zero, then those terms would just disappear because x1 and x2 would be zero. Well, if those terms disappear, well, notice this row would identify s1. You would get 1s1 equals 32. This row would identify s2. You would get 1s2 equals 84. And this row would identify p. You get p equals zero. So likewise, if you made them disappear here, then you can see that the first row would give you S1 to be 32, the second row would give you S2 to be 84, and the last row would get you P equals 0. Now, the problem that we run into, though, is even though that gives us a basic feasible solution, it doesn't give us the optimal solution because as long as we have negatives on the bottom row, we don't have the optimal solution identified yet. So that's a problem that we're going to run into. So I've kind of already talked to you about this, but this just sort of reiterates what I just said, that if you let x1 and x2 be, be non-basic, then it's just going to wipe out all of these terms, and you'll be able to identify s1 in row 1 is 32, S2 in row 2 is 84, and P in row 3 as 0. So again, so that would be what we would call, we actually would call that a feasible solution. So that's our initial feasible solution, but it's not the optimal solution, okay? So we still got more to go because if that was our optimal solution it wouldn't make much sense would it because whatever we're manufacturing we would just say manufacture zero of this and manufacture zero of this and that would give you a profit of zero assuming we were talking about profit okay so so now look at the bottom row to the left of the p column do you see any negative numbers now i'm talking about up here the bottom row left of the p column you see negative numbers right so that tells me that we have not reached the optimal solution yet. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to pivot on the tableau so that we can get a new feasible solution. Now the question is, where are we going to pivot? Well, you're going to have to know how to determine the pivot element. And so to, to pivot, we have to determine the pivot element. And the pivot element is determined by where the pivot column and the pivot row intersect. Now, how do I identify the pivot column? Well, to identify the pivot column, look at the negatives on the bottom row, and the one that is most negative identifies the pivot column. So take a look at, at these negative numbers. So negative 50 and negative 80. Well, negative 80 is the most negative indicator. So that would be 
your pivot column. Let me go ahead and highlight it over here too. So that's your pivot column, right? Okay, so that's our pivot column. So we know we got a pivot on this column. Now, by the way, you'll never pivot on the bottom row. So if we're going to pivot, we're going to pivot on either this number or this number. And so, so we're either going to pivot on the 2 or the 4 here. So let's see, how do we determine the pivot row? To identify the pivot row, take each positive number that is above the most negative number and divide them into their constants. You should get a positive value, and the smallest quotient identifies the pivot row. If there's a tie, you can use either row. Okay, so now take this number 2 and divide it into 32, and notice you'll get 16. Okay, so two, 32 divided by 2 is 16. And then take this number 4 and divide it into its constant, 84. 4 divided into 84 gives me 21. Now choose the smaller of these two, 16 or 21. Well, since 16 is the smaller, then I'm going to pivot on this row because I pivot on the smallest row, the, the, the row with the smallest quotient. So now look at what I've got now. I've got um, row 1 intersecting with column 2, and look where they intersect. They actually intersect right here at this 2. So that would be our pivot element. Okay. Now, that actually tells me something, because since I'm going to pivot on the x2 column, x2 is actually going to become a basic variable. So we'd say x2 is going to enter. And s1, since I'm pivoting on the s1 row, s1 is going to exit. It's actually going to leave as a basic variable, become non-basic. So x2 and s1 are, will trade places. All right, now you know how to pivot, because when I say pivot, I'm talking about what we were doing in uh, another, the earlier module, where you make this a 1, and then you use the 1 to eliminate the other elements in that column. So that's what I mean by pivot. So let's go through the first pivot here. Now we know we're going to pivot on this 2, right? OK. Now. In order to pivot on this, I need this to be a 1. So the first thing I do is multiply everything in that row by 1 half. So multiply row 1 by a half, okay, and that makes it a 1. Okay, then, here it is again, then I want to eliminate the 4, so I have to multiply this by negative 4 and add it to row 2, and so I'll let you just go through that row operation. And then I have to eliminate the negative 80, so multiply row 1 by 80 and add it to row 3. Okay, now let's look at what we have now uh, after we completed the first pivot. What we have now, notice now this column has the 1, 0, 0. And, of course, these are the other two columns that have the 1 and the zeros in it. So those are your three basic variables. So this tells me that x2 is now a basic variable, so notice I wrote it right here. And this column tells me that s2 is a basic variable, and it's identified with row 2. And then p is a basic variable, and it's identified with row 3. Okay, now, so if these are the three basic variables, then that means x1 must be non-basic, so therefore x1 must be 0, all right? And also, S1 must be non-basic, so it must be 0. And now I can look at row 1 and see that X2 must be 16, S2 must be 20, and P must be 1280. So that gives me another feasible solution. But that's not the optimal solution, because if you look at the bottom row, we still have a negative number. So we're going to have to go through another pivot process in a minute. Now, but remember, this solution was one of the corner points. The point 0, 016 was one of the corner points. So even though we don't have the optimal solution, we did get a better solution because we know at 0, 016, uh, our, our, max, our value for P will be 1280, and that's much better than 0. But we just haven't reached the optimal solution because we still have a negative on the bottom row. So obviously, we can do better than 1280, so we're going to have to go through another pivot. So I'll do this. I'll go through the second pivot beginning on the next video.